Welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Let me see some nods. Yes, wonderful. Um, I am Rabbi Avi Killip. I am the VP of Strategy and Programs at Hadar. Um, and if you're not familiar with Hadar, the heart of the organization is our yeshiva, which is on the Upper West Side normally, where we usually have full-time students and we run week-long seminars. Um, and right now, actually, we are running a really robust virtual Beit Midrash learning program that you can find at hadar.org. Um, and I think I want to share that at Hadar, we seek to teach Torah that is uncompromisingly honest, spiritually meaningful, and socially responsible. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do here tonight, which is a little bit of a tall order. Um, I'll start by saying that it's such an honor to be teaching this group. It's really incredible to see this many Westchester communities coming together, um, and in particular around this topic. Um, personally, I am in I am down south right now in Riverdale, um, a little bit south of you all, um, and I'm feeling a little bit grateful that we are at home in this rainy weather, um, able to come together without going out, um, and also feeling a little bit sad that we're not able to meet in person. Um, and I hope someday I will get to meet and schmooze and and play Westchester Jewish geography with each of you. Um, someday in the future, hopefully someday soon. Um, I also have to say it's such an honor to be teaching after Eric Ward in this series that we put together. Um, Eric Ward, who is really just doing incredible work in the world, um, he truly is an expert in the field. And you know that if you heard last week's lecture and if you didn't hear last week's lecture, I really encourage you to take the time to listen to the recording. We, we sent it out in the email about tonight and we'll send it out again in the next email. Um, so that's, that's really worth your time. So who am I and why am I teaching on this topic? Um, again, I'm, I'm Rabbi Avi Killip. I'm, I'm a teacher at Hadar and I would say racism and racism particularly in the United States is a topic that I've been working on and teaching on for a while now. Um, and it has always been a, a complicated and, and heated topic. I was just saying um, to Bachi, who's moderating our call tonight, thank you, Bachi, um, that I think this is, this is maybe some of the most important texts that I teach, and it's also some of the hardest texts that I teach. It's the hardest thing to hear and to study about always. And so I want to start just by thanking everyone for joining this call and for choosing to, to look towards this topic right now um, when we could be looking away. And just to acknowledge that actually it's more heated now than it ever has been. I would say this year since the murder of George Floyd, obviously um, this, this topic has become so complicated and so um, emotional for people um, in a way that makes it both, people are both more eager and also more afraid to engage with this topic. And that I, I can't not acknowledge that this two-part series of uh, Thursday night this week and Thursday night next week are straddling just, you know, any old Tuesday in between, um, no, are straddling this election in what makes this week maybe one of the most uh, stressful, urgent weeks that, that we've experienced in a long time. And so I sort of want to acknowledge that this is a hard topic, and it's a hard topic in a hard week. Um, and to thank you for, for joining this conversation um, and being willing to have these conversations in this hard week. Um, also, who am I to be teaching on this topic, right? I am a, a white female and there's, there's deep questions, right? About who, who is a white female rabbi to be teaching on the topic of racism in the United States? Um, and there are different answers to that question. Some people would tell you it is so important that white female rabbis teach on racism, right? Because we cannot leave the work of contemplating and thinking about racism in this country to black Americans, to black Jews, certainly. Like that's, that's not fair. It's our work to do. It's all of our work to do, not just their work to do. And some people would tell you it's totally inappropriate because if you wanna learn how to be anti-racist, how to think about anti-racism, we need to be learning from people like Eric Ward. 
um, and we don't need to, to hear white voices on this topic, there's good arguments in both of those directions. I have chosen to teach and write on this topic. Um, that may be, may be obvious because this is how we found ourselves here tonight. Um, and I did that, made that choice because in many Jewish settings, um, when I'm putting forward the topic of racism and what can the Talmud teach us about racism, I'm usually the only one raising that topic. Um, that's been true over the past several years, right? I had a, a scholar in residence gig that I did in January, um, most, the most recent one before COVID. And I gave the community three choices. And they said, well, we don't want to do the racism topic because we, it's like, that's a little political. Um, we try to steer away from politics in our community. Um, but, uh, but many times people have taken me up on teaching this topic at a Limud or, or a day of learning, a, a community gathering. Um, and in many cases there, people are just looking for some good, interesting, juicy Torah. Um, and I have the ability to raise this conversation and to bring it into the, the consciousness of the Jewish conversation. Um, and that's why I have chosen to sort of lean into this teaching as opposed to, to lean out. And just to say, that means I'm likely to get some things wrong um, and, and I think it's worth the risk, right? I'm not gonna say it's not worth the risk to have the conversation. If we're gonna get something wrong, we're gonna have the conversation and maybe You'll hear things tonight that make you unhappy or uncomfortable or you think are wrong, and it's worth that risk to, to have this conversation. Um, so what are our goals? I, I'll get, start with a framing that I learned from Rabbi Avital Hochstein, who is the Rosh Hashiva uh, president of Hadar in Israel, um, a teacher of mine, an important teacher of mine. And she taught me that when something is too hard, and too complicated. When life throws us challenges that are too hard and too complicated, we look to the Talmud. Um, that that is when in life, and she shares this really genuinely, that she she knows that like who who can teach us, who can be our teachers in holding really nuanced and complicated ideas. Our Talmud is actually very good at that. Um, and so that's sort of the impetus for why are we looking at the Talmud if we want to learn to be anti-racist? There's a whole range of scholarship about how to be anti-racist. But we as Jews, when we are struggling with something that we don't understand or we can't grapple with or we feel we need to, to um, change about our lives, what we do as Jews is we look to the Talmud and we see what that wisdom the Talmud has to offer us. So that's what we're going to do tonight and next Thursday night. Um, and what we're going to look at is explore three different paradigms from the Talmud to help us understand racism in the United States. And I want to be really clear that the texts that we are going to look at, none of the texts that we are going to look at are talking about race or racism. There are texts in the Talmud that talk about race and racism. These are not the texts that we're gonna look at because what we are looking for is paradigms to help us understand the, the problem or the phenomenon and what role we may play in that of racism in this country, not in particular learning on racism itself. Um, and I should also just say the Talmud, the Talmud won't and can't teach us how to be anti-racist for that. We actually do need to read all of those books um, and many book groups are happening in the Jewish community. I know many in the Westchester community as well. Um, that weren't learning is incredibly important and I would never want um, anyone to walk away from a class like this thinking that, yes, you can just study the Talmud in order to learn about racism. You have to also study about racism and about the particularities of this country and all of that work. This is, this is I think, a prerequisite to that or, or an addition, but it's not certainly not a substitute. Um, so what am I going to ask of you? I, I'll ask you to start with um, an open mind and a curiosity to try to understand how the frameworks that we're going to present work. How do you think they might apply? Like try them out in your brain and see, see how it works and only then get to the place of responding whether you think it's right or useful. And um, so you may have to sort of, you'll stick with me on hearing the Talmud, you'll hear how I think it applies. Um, and then we are gonna get to the stage of how we think it's useful 
and whether you think it's useful. So I'm going to start lecture style. Um, and actually, at, at near the end, um, maybe two thirds of the way through, we're going to have a chance to go into a breakout room um, in groups of four to actually talk to each other and see um, see how you you could play with these ideas. And I just want to say from the start, there is a phenomenon, a common phenomenon, when you are in a large uh, Zoom call like this, that when we go to breakout rooms, people just drop off. And so if that's something that you're going to do, I totally understand people are doing other things. But I really want to encourage you to say, actually, this kind of work of understanding racism cannot be done passively. Um, you can't do it just by listening. You have to actually also take the time to have the conversations and engage with each other. So I'll really encourage people to be brave enough to, to go into those rooms and have those conversations. Not to mention that this, this event is also meant to bring Westchester uh, communities together and give people a chance to meet each other. Um, and that's, that will be our best opportunity to do that. Um, two last qualifiers before we dive in. One is um, don't assume that everyone agrees with you. That, that may seem obvious. And I think also uh, we all are feeling so passionate about this topic right now and about racism in this country right now that I think sometimes people get caught off guard. We think I'm passionate about it and you're passionate about it. But then once we start talking, we come to realize that we, we didn't mean the same thing by the Black Lives Matter sign that we were holding. Um, we meant different things and maybe we meant drastically different things. And just being able to sort of remember always that um, I don't assume that anyone or every, certainly not everyone, but maybe even anyone on this call shares my exact views. Um, and we probably don't share, you don't share all the exact same views with each other. Um, so that's the first assumption we want to avoid. And the second is obviously let's, let's not assume that everyone is white, that everyone in Westchester is white, that everyone on this call is white. And certainly um, we don't want to assume that everyone has all white families and family members. So even if you find yourself in a breakout room with someone who you read as white to remember that they may have a different life experience than we do in a different family. Um, so we're going to go over three different paradigms. We will do one this week and we'll do two next week. Um, and I'm going to, to teach through the ideas in the Talmud. And then I will, I'll pause throughout for you to be able to ask questions about what is the Talmud actually saying and doing. Um, and then we're going to uh, break into groups and have time to digest. All right. So I'm going to, I'll give a little intro and then I'll ask Bachi to share the handout. Um, but also you'll have it in your in the chat if you're someone who wants to follow along. But you should know um, that the handout, it covers both weeks. So no need to read ahead. We're just in paradigm one. You can you can save the rest of the handout for next week. Um, or if you somehow can't make it next week, you, you'll have you'll have the sources to to check out as well. Okay, so the first paradigm um, really is something I started studying and thinking about in the summer of 2016. The summer of 2016 was the time that Eric Garner had just died, had just been murdered, um, and it felt like questions about racism were everywhere, right? Now it really feels that way. It felt that way even then, actually, in that summer. And that summer, I was studying Daf Yomi, which is a practice of studying one page of Talmud a day. Um, and I got to the beginning of Mizikin. Mizikin is the order of the Talmud. It's the name of an order of Talmud, um, an entire like section of Talmud of many books. Um, that is about damages. The word nazikin means damages. And it's actually, it's not an insignificant amount of the Talmud that is spent on addressing damages. Um, and in fact, the, the books in nazikin, there are three different tractates. If you've heard of Baba Kama, Baba Matiya, and Baba Batra, um, which really just means like first, second, and third. They were really one big book and they were so long that they were broken into thirds. And even in thirds, they're very long tractates. Um, there's a lot of time that the Talmud devotes to this, to this question of damage that we're doing in the world. Um, and so the beginning of Nezikin gives us categories of damage. 
Um, this is the part of the Talmud that talks about the goring ox. If you ever grew up hearing like my ox gored your ox and what do you owe? Um, I was always told this is the worst part of the Talmud. This is the most boring part of the Talmud. And the reason that students and Jews hate the Talmud is because somebody tried to start teaching them Talmud with these texts. These are totally irrelevant to people's lives. And they make people think like, well, I don't have an ox. Therefore, um, Talmud is irrelevant to my life. Um, I don't want to study anymore Talmud, and that's as far as people get. They get just, just those few lines in. Um, those are actually exactly the lines that we're going to look at tonight. I'll ignore the warning that everyone told me to never teach them. Um, in studying these texts while watching the news cycle about Eric Garner and Black Lives Matter when it was really taking off the first time, um, this nothing could have felt more relevant to me. Actually, these texts felt unbelievably relevant. Um, the Talmud is offering us is categories of damage. What it's trying to teach us is that not all damage is uniform. There are different kinds of damage and the different kinds of damage are broken down by motivation, right? The way the Talmud, with which could have chosen many ways to assess damage, decides to create categories of damage. Um, these are avot nezikin, they're categories of nezikin. You may have studied like avot malachot of Shabbat. It's like categories of work on Shabbat. These are categories of damage and then different examples of damage will fall into the categories. And the way that the Talmud names the categories is after different body parts of an animal. Karen, Shane, and Regal. So Karen are horns, right? Like the antlers on the, on the goring ox. Shane is teeth, shinaim, if you know Hebrew, um, and regel, if you know Hebrew, you may also know reglaim, regel is, is leg. These are the three different um, parts of the animal in the three different categories. Okay, so Bachi, you can share the handout for us, um, and that will give us a chance to work through the text here. Um, I'm going to make everyone a little smaller so I can see. You can scroll down so I can read to you uh, Talmud Bavli Babakama. Okay. This, these, this, I'm going to, I'm going to read through the Talmud. We'll teach about what's happening and then we will go back and um, I'll go, and then I'll go back through and explain how I think each category can be useful for thinking about racism in this country. Okay, I'm gonna work in the English, but you have you have the, the Hebrew Aramaic there for you to look at in the original. The sages taught, there are three primary categories were stated with regard to an ox. The goring, which is karen, literally horn. The eating, shein, literally tooth. And the trampling, regel, which is literally leg. Okay, so the the actual uh, original just says Karen, Shane, Regal, um, and instead of translating them as horn, tooth, leg, the, trans the translators here, I pulled these from Safaria, have translated them as uh, goring, eating, and trampling. So what are those categories? We're gonna see what the Talmud has to teach us about them. Okay, the first category is goring. Um, what is the subcategory of goring? It is pushing, Nagifa is the original, biting, crouching upon items with the objective of inflicting damage and kicking. So this category includes any action that an ox performs with its body with the objective of inflicting damage. Okay, so what is a goring ox? A goring ox is an angry animal, you know, if you think of like bathing the bull, right, we're going to like, it's going to come at you. Um, it's an angry animal that is actively trying to hurt you, right? If a goring ox runs you down and causes harm to you or to any of your property, it was not an accident, right? That, uh, that ox caused damage intentionally to cause damage to hurt you. That's what it's trying to do. This is the first category, right? This is exactly the kind of ox that you never, you never want to encounter, um, a goring ox. Okay, so we'll scroll, we'll look at, uh, we don't need to scroll, right? We'll look at Shane. This is category two. Um, Shane is the euphemism for eating. What's the subcategory of eating? An animal that rubs against a wall for its pleasure 
or sullied produce uh, for its pleasure. Okay, so shame is the category that includes any action performed with the intention of seeking pleasure that inadvertently causes damage. Okay, so the eating is the easiest example to think of, right? You are a, um, you are a farmer, you've worked so hard on growing your crop, and my ox came over and ate your entire crop of carrots that you've just harvested, right? My uh, that's real damage. You lost all of your produce, all of your belongings. You are definitely worse off financially. There was real damage done. Um, but the animal did not eat your carrots in order to cause harm to you, right? The animal ate your carrots because it was hungry. It was trying to self-satisfy. It was seeking its own pleasure. Um, and that's why the animal ate the, ate the crop. Um, so that's, that's like the, the header example, right? And then we get these other examples, right? An animal rubbed against a wall for its pleasure. So this story, right, every, the beautiful thing about studying Talmud is that every phrase, every word has like a whole story in it that you can just imagine and blow up to play as a scene in your mind, okay? So this is the animal had an itch on its back. It's like scratching up against the wall to try to scratch the itch but it's stronger, it doesn't know its own strength, right? And the wall falls over, like my animal just destroyed your fence. You have real damage. And you may even have the same level of damage as when my animal intentionally gored the fence of the neighbor across the street, right? You both lost your fence. But in case one, the animal was trying to knock the fence over. And in this case, the animal was trying to scratch his back. Right, that's all he's trying to do. And he inadvertently knocks over your fence, right? Interestingly, um, in the Talmud, this is the like sullied the produce. Interestingly, in the Talmud, uh, urinating counts in this category of pleasure, right? Like if an animal pee, you know, pees on something, it's like if, a dog, if I bring my dog to your house and it pees on your carpet, it wasn't because it hates your carpet or it hates you, it's because like, it, it was a self-satisfying activity for the animal um, to urinate on the carpet. I think about that even with people, if you're like, oh yeah, somebody peed on the side of the building. It's like, were they trying to vandalize the building or were they like, they drank too much and they really needed to pee and it was a, self, a self-fulfilling pleasure seeking activity. The damage may be the same, like you gotta clean it up anyway, it smells just as bad, um, but the intent behind the action is different. Karen, intent to hurt, and Shane is intent for self-pleasure, self-seeking pleasure. Okay, the last one is a little bit more nuanced and complicated to understand here is rego. What is the subcategory of trampling, walking, yeah? Um, it caused damage with its body in the course of its walking, with its hair in the course of its walking, or with its rope, um, or with a bit, a bitumen is the like thing it's eating in its mouth um, that it has in its mouth, with a, or with the bell around its neck. Um, what is different about trampling that the damage is commonplace and the animal is your property and the responsibility for its safeguarding to prevent it from causing damage is incumbent upon you, its owner. Um, the last one is <clears throat> in the subcategory of trampling, as well, the damage is commonplace and the animal is your property and it's your responsibility to safeguard it. Okay, trampling is, it's not even like the, the animal that was trying to rub up against the fence, right? It wasn't trying to knock the fence over, but it did choose to actively do something, right? It chose to rub against the fence or it chose to eat the produce. Um, regal is activities Damage caused by an animal just in its in the way it's going, right? It's dera halicha in the original, right? It's just like it's just the way animals walk through the world causes damage. Um, if I take my uh, my ox, right, my animal, and I just like walk right over your cross, you would say. 
there's not the animal didn't do anything. The animal was just walking. And when an animal walks over crops, the crops are destroyed. And you would blame the owner for walking the animal through a field of crops, right? You would say there's nothing wrong with the animal here. Um, in the case of the goring animal, actually, if an animal, you know, that we start to hold the animal accountable, we say that's a dangerous animal. Um, but in the case of, of regal, it's not a dangerous animal. It's just an animal. Um, and it's the situation that we put the animal in that made it dangerous um, or that is what caused the damage. I like to think of it as um, the, the saying, a bull in a china shop. Don't, you know, it's, it's as dangerous as a bull in a china shop, right? Um, nobody, nobody's like, ah, yes, because bulls hate china and they want to destroy the dishes. Like, that's not, um, that's not what that saying means, right? What that saying means is the nature of a bull is not to be gentle and delicate um, to ensure not to break the china. Um, the nature of the bull is sort of to be wild. And if you don't want it to break, then you can't bring the bull into, into the china shop. Um, you have to actually take some responsibility about that mismatch between the way of walking, the way the animal walks through the world and where you lead that animal. Um, so you get interesting, you know, sub conversations in the Talmud about like, well, if my animal tramples over your pottery, who's liable, you know, then the question is like, one of the questions they ask is, well, did I bring my animal into your pottery shop or did you set up your pottery shop in the middle of the road where animals usually go, because that will actually change the way that, um, the way that culpability is, is taken there. Okay, so we have these three categories. Um, I'm going to go back through and talk about how I think they relate to our question of racism, but first I'll pause and take if anyone has any um, questions you can put in the chat and we can take a minute like a clarifying question of um of what what's actually going on here no i i, I think we'll keep the keep the text up um but if people want to ask any question in the chat we could maybe take one or two If Karen is dangerous and Regal is normal, what is Shane? Um, I think that they're all dangerous and that they all cause harm. Um, but it's like Shane feels like it's an intermediate intent um, as opposed to the like intent to hurt versus like totally, totally fine. Um, yeah, so, so how it plays out like what, what are people responsible for in these different categories is also um, is also going to depend a lot on like the particular situations um, that come that come to play in the different examples that the Talmud plays out. Again, these are like long long sections of Talmud. There's a lot of juicy stuff under under each category. Um, okay, let's see. To clarify, the boring ox did not intend to harm the individual; rather, the ox was triggered in some way. Um, and responded accordingly. It's not a personal attack. So I don't know. We don't know necessarily. I think the, um, you know, I appreciate this this defense of the ox um, here. I think that the ox, um, the ox may have been baited, or it may, you know, it may just be like a, a wild ox. I think some some animals are more aggressive than others. It may just be a more aggressive animal. Um, but in any event, it's it's the animal is intending to cause harm. Like there's some aggression, maybe aggression is actually a good word here. There's some aggression in the action that is, you don't find any aggression in the next two, in the next two categories. That's really uh, um, a distinction. Okay, so how does this help us, right? You're like, well, this is nice, Avi. You just taught us the most boring piece of Talmud that you, you prefaced as such. Why did you bring this for us? Um, here's why. I think these can be extremely useful categories for thinking about racism, the way it plays out in the United States. I think that for a long time, white Americans have asked themselves, am I causing racist damage in the way I live my life? And they 
think only about the category of Karen. We only think about this first category, right? We say, am I actively trying to cause harm to Black Americans? Nope. And then we say, great, no damage here. I'm, I'm fine. I'm off the hook. I'm not, a, I'm, I've got no more work to do. Um, and, and for many people, I think that's where people still are. Um, but I think it, it has been the case, especially like you can feel the shift in this awakening that we've, we've mostly focused when we said racism in the United States. Um, most people are picturing activities that would fall into this Karen category, right? I feel like I also have to say that um, that even since 2016 to now, like when I started teaching this to now, um, it feels like when I started teaching it, it was like, well, everybody knows we're not doing the goring intent. And, and I have to say, I feel like I have watched like races, as, as there is a segment of racism that has become more acceptable in this country, um, there, is, there are more examples actually of racist activities that feel like they fit into this first category, right? People are more willing to actually just openly express um, racist ideas or, you know, ideas that, that Black lives don't matter, you know, it's like that, that never would have thought like, oh yeah, there's a group of people who think that black lives don't matter and are willing to say that. Um, I think that that's become actually a little bit more acceptable. Um, we've seen more of it. We've seen more racism present. And I think that it has actually had an effect also in the last four years of making it easier for the rest of us to feel that we are um, off the hook, right? Because we see, when you see more Karen racism, you're like, wow, I am not that. I have nothing to do with that. I'm, I'm distancing myself from that. Um, and then we're like, great, I did my anti-racism work. Like, I, I clarified that I'm, I'm not Karen. Um, I can rid my, my conscience is clean, right? Um, I think also, I, I taught this class, um, I taught this class a couple of times since at George Floyd's murder, and someone said, like, was like, oh, George Floyd's murder felt like Karen. I think, like, one of the reasons why watching that video was so alarming to so many of us is that it it felt like um, it was in a different, it felt like it qualified in that category. It felt like you were watching someone who was trying to intentionally inflict harm. Um, and that that sort of, I think, is one of the things that helped raise the alarm bells that people said like, oh, racism isn't a problem because it's here or it's here. And suddenly it felt like I was seeing it in that first category. So even if my, my previous assumption was I can dismiss it unless it's worse than that category, um, we were like, oh, no, it is, it is as bad as this category, maybe, and we got to pay attention. Um, but once we start paying attention, then we may say, like, okay, but my conscience is clean. I'm fine. I don't do, I don't do Karen. Um, you know, Karen, I would say, is like, um, like lynching, right? It's like, uh, like the really horrible slavery, intentional harm, um, or even just like harassment, you know, a, a workplace, a har like a boss who is intentionally harassing Black employees, as opposed to like employees aren't feeling equal treatment, but the boss is doing their best. You know, that's not the category of Karen. Karen is like, yeah, the boss thinks that the Black employees need to work harder, so I give them a harder time. It's intentional, it's intentional damage. Um, that's category one. Um, I think that the biggest, my biggest message is like, let's not let ourselves off the hook just because we passed the test of not causing Karen damage. Um, then I think the next, the next category is shame, right? Shame is the category of an action that I'm intentionally doing, but I'm doing it for self-seeking reasons. Uh, for seeking my own pleasure, but I'm inadvertently causing damage. So I'll give some examples. Um, I think of this as like, I, I certainly did not ever want there to be fewer Black students enrolled at Brandeis University, right? I would never want that. But I did want a spot for myself when I applied. 
to Brandeis University, and I did take that spot. Um, that's that's a totally, I was totally, that's a self-seeking pleasure, but it may have had an impact, actually, because if the admissions people looked at my my application and the application of another Black teenager and chose to accept me, there may have been some damage done in the way that they judged our applications, but there's no, um, there's certainly no malintent on my part. Um, another example, I would say, I don't know anyone who's like, you know what we should do? We should gentrify that black neighborhood and make it so that black families can't afford to live there anymore. I, I, I don't think anybody has that kind of a, um, intent to cause damage, but I do think that there are people who say, I want to buy a home in a neighborhood that I can afford, or I want I want to rent in that particular apartment because it's in a good school zone or because it's near the community. You know, I can walk to the school from that apartment. Um, and then, you know, I try to go and apply for that apartment and I get accepted, whereas the, the Black family that applied for the same apartment didn't get accepted because the, the board was like, I don't know, something about that white family makes me feel like they might be more responsible. Um, and so, you know, wrongly, I should say, probably. Um, I mean, very responsible. But, um, but that that's, that would be a totally pleasure-seeking activity. It's not at all with intent to damage. Um, and yet the damage can be real. And actually, like from the other perspective of the Black families, that over the course of their life, all of these different um, moments could really change what's happening for them. I'll give another example that somebody raised the last time I taught this that I thought was really interesting. Um, she talked about the phenomenon of uh, white women who cross the street when a black man is walking towards you. Um, and she said, like, I don't, I certainly am not thinking, like, I, I hope bad things for that man. I hope he feels um, like a monster. I hope he knows that he feels shunned. It's, it's completely coming from a place of self-preservation, right? There is something in this person walking towards me, and probably because of the way I've been socialized and we as a society have been socialized, to feel as a white woman with a Black man walking towards me, that makes me feel like I would be safer on the other side of the street. Um, that, that kind of activity is never done from a place of like, malintent, right? It's not Karen, but there can be damage there. Um, and I'm, I'm teaching this frontally, so you're not all getting to respond, but I'll say that like, um, when I taught this, you know, I was in a breakout room, someone shared this as an example, um, and there was someone else in the room who said like, that's ridiculous. It does not hurt that man if you walk across the street. Like, he's fine. Um, and and I think that that's also an example of like, I'm sort of sharing that perspective to say, if that's what you are thinking right now, you're not alone. And I think it's worth grappling with that question actually to say like, well, is there damage and is there damage one time and or is there damage if every time a white woman is walking towards you, she crosses the street? Um, is there a whole realm of relationship building and conversations that will never happen um, because we're avoiding those those neighbors, but not other neighbors in our lives. Um, and something, it's something for, for us, I think, to actually grapple with um, is a question of what kind of opportunities did I seek for myself? I wanted that internship. I wanted that opportunity. I wanted that great job um, that actually may have had some, some negative impact. Um, Rego. Regal is the last category, and again, I think it's the most complicated um, way to articulate, uh, one to articulate and to think about how we might, um, how this might help us understand racism in this country. And I think it's the one that, uh, that people want to reject the most, and even I want to reject the most, right? Because Regal is damage that you do just by being you. Right. Um, it makes me think about a I, I learned once from a teacher that said um, 
black male bodies in this country are controlled in the name of protecting white women. Black male bodies in this country are controlled in the name of protecting white women. Um, it was like, we, how did we get this mass incarceration problem in, of black Americans being locked up? And part of that was a, a narrative that was created about like, your wives aren't safe. You know, like the, your daughters aren't safe from black men. Um, and that was an incredibly painful Thing for me to hear, right? And you want to reject it. You want to say, well, I don't, well, I don't want it then. Like, I don't want to, don't, don't do that for me. Like, I don't want mass incarceration on my shoulders in my name, right? It's in your name, Avi, as a, as a white woman. Um, and a feeling of like, but I don't have an option of not being a white woman. That wasn't a, a choice. And, and how can you tell me that I'm causing racist damage just by being a white woman, um, if there's nothing I can do to stop that, right? If there's nothing I can do to prevent that damage. Um, so I'll give an example, just, just to try to give some example of like, what does it mean to say that just your presence um, walking through the world could cause damage? I, I work, right, our, our yeshiva, Yeshivat Hadar is on, on near the 72nd subway station. I live in Riverdale. I was in my previous life when one did such a thing, was commuting in every day. Um, and I would say not infrequently, I would walk down into the subway station at 72nd Street, and I would find that the only people in the station were police and, and Black men, right? A Black man or a couple Black men. Um, and I started to try to be thoughtful actually about how does my presence walking into that scene impact the safety of the black men who are in that subway station, right? If I mind my own business versus I'm not there at all versus I walk over and start to have a conversation and I say like, hey, where are you headed? What time is it? Um, you know, is there a sense that the police is going to say like, well, hey, what's going on over there? Like, is everything okay? Is she okay? Does she need care or protection? Um, you know, if I walk through a Black neighborhood that is heavily policed um, intentionally, uh, you know, is there a way that the police are going to perk up and feel like, oh, that girl, I better protect her. Um, I better pay attention to that woman. Um, I think also about like regal as in just like, just how are you walking through the world? Um, I like this, this summer, my family drove from Riverdale to Atlanta to spend a few weeks with family. And then we drove back up like, you know, a 16 hour drive in each direction. And nobody pulled us over at any point in either direction. And I didn't expect anyone to pull us over because nobody ever pulls us over. Um, and, and there's a way in which like, that's just me walking through the world, right? I'm not doing anything <laughs> um, to anyone. I'm just living my life. And yet, like how many black families, you know, in other minivans doing the same pilgrimage that we were driving up and down the coast, maybe did get pulled over? And how many times did they get pulled over? And if they weren't there with those, you know, were they actually like accounting for speeding tickets that I wasn't getting, even though I was also speeding, um, because those quotas were being filled, the ticket quotas were being filled by other families. Um, and certainly to say, well, Avi, what are you supposed to do? Like, you have to live in the world. You can't not, um, you can't not drive down to Atlanta. Um, and I think, you know, I've had people say, even the applying to college example, which I put in Shane, like maybe that actually goes in regal, right? It's like, I was just living in the world. Like applying to college is just living in the world. And yet maybe that's causing damage. And I think that um, the answer to that, I, I'll sort of give two framings. One is that um, one way to think about it, I think, is if you if you think about the idea of like, who's responsible in that last category, it's the animal. It's not the animal, it's the owner. Um, it's to say that like, what if the animal here in terms of the metaphor is your whiteness, right? If I'm like, I'm in charge of my whiteness and I'm in charge of figuring out how I wield 
that whiteness in the world. That's maybe the a, a way of understanding the like, where do you put the animal? Um, like, uh, where are you taking your animal? What are you choosing to do with the animal in the world? It's like my being white is not inherently a problem, but how I wield that whiteness is, right? If I get into a fight with someone and I intentionally call over a cop or somebody that I know is intent is gonna side with me, you know, if I if I walk into a store, um, you know, it may be that a clerk is gonna come to me first just because I'm a white woman, if I'm standing next to a black woman who's asking for the same product, um, they're going to maybe serve me first. That's different than if I know, like, well, if I start crying now, they'll probably like pay attention to me. Or if I, if I try to use that, um, that maybe is one way to think about it. And I think the other way to think about it, which I'm even more compelled by, is to say um, the problem is not in the bull, right? The problem is the environment surrounding is the China shop, right? Is the environment surrounding. Is what we need to strive for if we want to get to a place where there is no racist damage in this country, then what we need to strive for is, um, is changing the system, right? We need to change the college application system. They need to change the apartment rental process so that my applying for the apartment doesn't necessitate racist damage happening in this country. Um, that this, the thing that is so frustrating about Regal as a category is also what is so frustrating about um, racism in the United States is you can't opt out of it, actually. It is, it is uh, the whole system has to change in order for you to get out of, of causing that damage. Um, okay, that was a lot. Um, we have these three categories. My my proposal is that these three categories can be helpful um, in thinking more deeply about what are the problems and what's my role in how I address and take accountability for those. Um, so what I want to do, we don't have a lot of time, <laughs> but what I want to do is we're going to go into um, we're going to go into breakout rooms and and just quickly introduce yourself and say your name um, and share what community you are from and um, and share, let's see, let me find my questions I wanted us to ask. Um, do you find these categories of damage useful in thinking about racism and your role? And can you think of examples from each category? Like in your own mind, um, are you like, yep, this category helps me understand the phenomenon of X? that I, I see or experience in the world. Um, and again, I'll encourage you, even in this moment, to start with, can I find a way to use them? And then, and then you can get to the layer of like, nope, it wasn't useful. I'm, I'm rejecting it as a, as a framework overall. Um, okay, so, so Bachi is gonna put, put us into groups. And again, I encourage you to be, be brave enough to go to a group. It takes bravery on its own to like talk to a stranger at 8 p.m. at night um, and be brave enough to really share on this topic, which is so, so hard in this week, which is so hard. Um, and we'll come back at the end for a closing. I hope that you got to meet someone new um, and, and form a little connection in this isolating moment and also that you had a chance to, to maybe hear a different perspective um, and, and deepen a little bit your own perspective. Um, I would love in the, in our last two minutes, if you can take a minute, um, I'll actually pause for a minute to write into the chat something that you are chewing on, something you heard that was interesting, something you're taking away, um, something that you're thinking about um, from, from these texts and from these paradigms. Um, and I'll, I'll pause a minute to give you a chance, a chance to write. Really enjoyed reading everyone's comments that I missed while I was teaching during your breakout. Once the first person is brave enough to hit post, then other people will do it also. Do you want to say something? You yeah. Want? Can someone just speak here? Yeah, sure. OK. All right, I'm but good. just to know that we have a minute, so you have like 30 seconds, and then I'm going to take the last 30 well, seconds. Considering how much 30 seconds counts on CNN, 
Look, <laughs> well, I'm Judy's husband. I, I came to this country when I was 27 from Romania. I had not seen a black person in Romania with the exception of a boxer who, whatever. And the idea about racism, white for black, I had no idea about it. My parents, if anything, they were assimilated Jews who looked quite down on, let's see, the far more religious and far more traditional Jews in our family. I learned here that the word Schwarze, if you know what that means, was a cuss word, was a derogative word that the parents taught their children. So item number one, some of this is maybe David said, the background makes a difference. The other thing I want to say, I would like to know what our black neighbors, our black business partners, and I've had a business partner, a wonderful guy back in the early 1970s, understand by Black Lives Matter, what would they like to achieve from us? That yeah. will really come out. Great. Um, your 30 seconds, yeah. Um, I appreciate I appreciate sharing that. And I really do think um, the reason why I, I always title this as racism in the United States is that I do think that anti-Black racism in the United States um, is a particular category of racism, right? And if you want to understand it, you have to actually study about the United States history. Um, I think about, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I actually grew up with a lot of like uh, Confederate like narrative. Um, and there's like, I remember distinctly this, you know, say coming home, my father is from New York and my mother is from Savannah, Georgia and saying, what side was our family on in the civil war? Like I lived in Atlanta. I knew that, you know, what does Atlanta stand for? And my father saying we were against the czar which like he thought was hilarious. And for years I was like, yeah, that's funny. That's the answer. We were against the czar. Like we were in Russia. We had nothing to do with the civil war in America. And then I think one of the things that I reckoned with um, as an adult is that I was using that as an excuse actually. Like, well, I have a Jewish story and it's a Jewish European story. And like, I wasn't around for slavery and therefore it's not my problem or it's not my legacy. Um, I don't have to pick sides in the civil war because I'm not part of that. Um, and actually feeling like I need, to, I need to own that now and take responsibility for it. Um, and then I appreciate your last point of, um, which is I think a great way to end and to circle back is to say, um, this is not work that we are going to solve by studying the Talmud. As much as I find studying the Talmud incredibly useful um, and moving and powerful to help me unpack my Jewish experience of, of where do I fit into this? Um, but actually we're gonna do this work by being in conversation with, um, with black neighbors and black Jews and black non-Jews um, about, about history and legacy in America. Um, and the last thing I'll just say in conclusion is that um, Nazikin, the entire tractate and the concept of damages in the Talmud, the goal is not, um, the, the Talmud has no pretense right, that the goal is to live in a world where there is no damage. Like that, that's not the goal. The goal is to say like, let's, let's figure out when to, when we live in a society with each other, there's likely to be damage and let's figure out how to minimize it and hold ourselves accountable to it. Um, and that that's, that's the mandate that we have before us, um, that we have before us in these texts. And I think in this moment in this country, um, we are, going to gather together again next Thursday night, which will be a very different world or it will be exactly the same world. We don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be a week, <laughs> um, but we will be here. One thing you can know about next week amidst any other uncertainty is that on Thursday night, we will be here again to, to explore two more paradigms that I think are, are equally useful to this one. So I hope that you'll join us. Um, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening um, and that we can continue to come together and be partners in, in this really complicated um, exploration and also in the work. So thank you all. Right.